We are, of course, in the last week of the Year of Faith, and I want to read a very brief passage from the document called Porta Fidei, um, you might say Gate of Faith, uh, with which Pope Benedict opened uh, the Year of Faith now uh, over a year ago. He wrote, it often happens that Christians are more concerned for the social, cultural, and political consequences of their commitment, continuing to think of the faith as a self-evident presupposition for life in society. In reality, not only can this presupposition no longer be taken for granted, but it is often openly denied. The Pope continues, whereas in the past it was possible to recognize a unitary cultural matrix broadly accepted in its appeal to the content of the faith and the values inspired by it, today this is no longer the case in large sections of society because of a profound crisis of faith that has affected many people. That's paragraph two, actually. Now, in inviting me to speak here at Westminster as the year of faith draws to a close, Archbishop Nichols drew my attention to this passage. And he was thinking of the challenges posed for the Catholic faith in his words, quote, when the wider culture is not particularly supportive of the act of faith, and may indeed, I'm saying, be hostile to a whole range of central Christian beliefs. I want to consider this issue in a context my place, I'm sorry, <laughs> that might prove helpful to you precisely in your role as witnesses to the faith in whatever form that takes in communities where a commitment to this faith is no longer, as Pope Benedict said, a self-evident presupposition for life in society, or as Archbishop Nichol said, when the wider culture is not particularly supportive. When, we might say, the culture poses challenges that seem to stand in the way of an encounter with the living God. Now the process by which a generally supportive cultural and social environment for the faith, such as I experienced more or less in my early life, and many of you perhaps, and certainly the parents of many of you, how that generally supportive cultural and social environment came to be eroded is one that stretches over uh, several centuries and is usually called secularization. We find ourselves in a secular age, as Ch Charles Taylor has called it. He's a Catholic Canadian philosopher um, who wrote a large book called A Secular Age extremely helpful book. In preparing for this presentation, I have shifted my focus from the situation with which I am more familiar, that is the United States, to that of Western Europe and the British Isles. Although the church in the US is facing very strong secularizing trends, in many ways not unlike yours, there is a persistent re residual, we might say, religiosity eclectic at times, without necessarily particular religious affiliations, which makes the situation there somewhat different from what is being experienced on this side of the Atlantic, although not terribly different either. Significantly, the new evangelization, a term coined by Pope John Paul II and used by subsequent pontiffs, seems at least in recent years to be focused principally on reviving the faith here in Europe, where the decline is perceived to be more pronounced and troubling, let's say, than the other side of the pond. In any case, I have tried to study the literature about this phenomenon as it manifests itself in Europe and England, as you will see from the bibliography. While no one disputes the basic elements of the new social and cultural situation in which we live, 
There is considerable disagreement among historians, sociologists, and theologians who have studied the matter, and philosophers as well, about whether to identify this process as a religious decline, strictly speaking, or simply a long-term process of religious change, which is the conceptualization McLeod prefers. I should mention something now about these books. I, I have found McLeod very helpful, and I have also referred to other books there's an extraordinarily helpful volume, depending on how deeply you want to go into this, the fourth, uh, uh, which I have read since I first prepared this lecture, um, Nancy Christie and Michael Govro. It's Canadian, the University of Toronto Press. It's a hefty volume with many contributions, and it is one of the few that I have seen that takes seriously the sexual revolution as an element in this development, and particularly, as you see from the title, the 60s. But as I say, it depends on what, how much time you have and how much particular interest you have in the subject. It's quite fascinating. However, as you will see, it's not going to be mine, but I'll let you know that in a moment. Callum Brown, and in his ominously entitled The Death of Christian Britain, attribute secularization to a gradual loss of interest in religion on the part of women. It's a fascinating thesis that has been controversial and also much discussed. Everyone talks about it. Hugh McLeod again offers, I think, a very balanced account. While the sobering volume of the former Anglican canon, now a Catholic, Edward Norman, traces the seepage of secularizing trends into the church itself fascinating little book, which I strongly recommend, especially to priests and prelates. And of course, my confrere, Aidan Nichols, keeps us all hoping for the best, uh, as he is wont to do. However we read these trends, it remains true that in this secular age, the Pope's words, faith is no longer a self-evident presupposition for life in society, nor to use archbishops, the wider culture is not particularly supportive. I think it is important for us to try to understand the history of this process and the situation in which we find ourselves, but that's not the principal focus of this presenta presentation. My sense is that it would be more helpful to you in this non-academic setting to address some of the main challenges that face us in these circumstances, however they came to have arisen. Can they be identified? I mean, can we say, what is the problem? Can those who are charged with preaching, catechesis, the communication of the faith, which all of us in some way or other are, do something about these challenges to address them effectively. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Not self-evident, by the way. The answer to that is not self-evident, as we shall see. These are some of the questions we'll be considering. I should note at the start that this belongs at least in part to the art, if not a science really, of apologetics because it's very ad hoc. It depends on who you're talking with. I mean, apologetics with a Buddhist is going to be different than apologetics with Richard Hawkins. Although apologetics is normally understood as a reasoned defense of the faith against objections from outside the community, sometimes it must be deployed within the community itself in order to address the confusions and misunderstandings that block or undermine full participation in the life of faith. There's nothing odd about this when trying to explain something to someone, whether it be mathematics or engineering or philosophy or history. We often have to correct mistaken ideas they may have before we can communicate the truth in question. When the challenges are at least in part intellectual, when the issues of correct meaning of the Catholic faith are involved, when misunderstandings of what it is that the church proposes can block the way to the encounter with the living God, or to participation in the worship of the church, or to a life of faithful discipleship, 
and so on. In these situations, we need to include some sort of apologetic moment according to our needs and according to our abilities and the circumstances that present themselves to us. Not all challenges are intellectual in nature, not easy for a Dominican to admit, but it is the case. Today we are considering those sorts of challenges that can be reasoned through, in other words, in which argument is useful. In particular, I want to consider some specific, specific intellectual challenges that arise from within the wider culture and have been internalized by many, many people in their understanding of their Catholic faith. It seems to me that this is a critical task for all of us and, of course, a central feature of the new evangelization, of evangelization, period. People today are influenced by a unique set of circumstances and global events, moral and social values, technologies, cultural and beha behavioral norms. An effective witness needs to try to understand how this background shapes people's understanding of the faith. Attitudes of non-Catholic friends also have to be taken into account since their negative perceptions of Christianity have a remarkably strong influence on Catholic faithful. Somebody has written a whole book about this, a sociologist. It's not on the bibliography and I can't even remember the title, forgive me. As Catholic believers, we have to respect and be willing to engage these intellectual challenges and questions as people pose them in their struggle to understand their faith. Again, as I say, according to our positions and circumstances, we have to avoid the temptation to fudge, strong one, to adapt to the faith so as to make it palatable to modern tastes and expectations. This so-called accommodationist approach, to use an, a word coined in the 70s by Peter Berger, a famous sociologist, this accommodation approach generally fails. There is a risk that in this approach, the Christian message becomes indistinguishable from everything else on offer in the market stalls of secularized religious faith. If I may quote Nichols quoting Norman, in the powerful yet soft secularizing totalitarianism of distinctively modern culture, our greatest enemy is the church's own internal secularization, which when it occurs, does so through the largely unconscious adoption of the ideas and practices of seemingly benign adversaries. That's as I say Nichols, quoting Norman. Addressing the challenges to faith, whatever the audience we have in view or the persons, demands a robust sort of apologetics. No one in his or her right mind will be interested in a faith about which its exponents seem too embarrassed to communicate forthrightly. Who's interested in a product that the, uh, that the salesman cannot describe in a way that makes it attractive? We have to be convinced that the fullness of the truth and beauty, we should add, of the message about Jesus Christ is powerfully attractive when it is communicated without apologies or compromise. That was the approach of enormous power of Pope John Paul II. For that alone, we should be canonized. Our reasoning has to be based on solid theological principles. We have to know what we're talking about and it has to be an integrated vision of the Catholic faith in its integrity, as I say, and interconnectedness. It's a whole. Now, we also have to avoid the sometimes tempting response, it's a mystery, just uh, to cover for theological ignorance on the part of people who should know better. Especially with people who have questions, it is a mistake to cry mystery, as I say, too soon. In fact, when an explanation is available and needed, sometimes all we can say is it's a mystery. But we shouldn't rush to that expression too quickly. I'm going to focus on three challenges or misunderstandings that must be addressed in order to help people encounter the living God in faith. I believe that they constitute the three biggest challenges 
but there are plenty of others. They are powerful and well entrenched and at the root of many of the others. They are strongly reinforced by the wider culture. Some of what I say will seem like common sense, but it isn't necessarily. They concern what it means to call Christ the Savior, what it means to be authentically human, and what it means to be moral. I want to offer you some understanding of the nature of these challenges and some ideas on how to confront them effectively. Also, simply think about it, even if you never have to talk about them to anyone, just to think about them yourselves. And I'm following here straight now through the three points, uh, three main sections of the uh, outline that you have in front of you. Why we need the Savior who is not just any Savior. This challenge concerns Jesus Christ himself, the center, you might say, of our faith. It's incredible in a way, but it's the case. The most fundamental and prevalent misunderstanding of the Catholic faith that we face is the notion that it is arrogant to claim that Jesus Christ is the unique mediator of salvation. To ascribe a uniquely salvific role to Jesus Christ seems to constitute a denial of the salvific role of other religious founders, and thus could be considered an affront to their communities. You've heard this. The origins of this difficulty lie deep in the mentality of post-enlightenment modernity and its theological progeny. According to this mentality, now this is very, very important. All religions express some experience of the absolute, the ultimate, or the transcendent reality. A friend of mine says that capital letters do a lot of work in this point of view. So you have to see a capital A, absolute, and so on, ultimate, transcendent. How no religion can claim to possess a privileged description of a reality incomprehensible and ineffable to all equally. See, so the transcendent is beyond description, beyond knowledge even, and it's described, attained, you might say, in different ways in the different religions. But it remains, as I often say, and as I said in the book on the matter once, X. We might call this mentality and the cultural, uh, religious outlook it fosters the culture of pluralism. Its greatest exponent was, may God rest his soul, John Hick. It surrounds us on every side and is often found in the church itself as the ferocious reaction to Dominus Jesus, amply demonstrated. This, of course, document, well, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which dates to the 90s, I can't remember exactly, was a, a, a defense of the uniqueness of Christ's salvific role and of the church in that economy of salvation. Now, in order to address, address this challenge, we need in the first place to make clear that our faith in Christ's uniqueness does not entail a devaluation of the world's religions, or indeed of anyone's particular religious experience. The religions of the world are, mo are monuments to the human search for God. This was a strong theme of Pope Benedict. As such, they are worthy of respect and study because of the immense cultural richness of their witness to the desire for God planted in every human heart. But the Christian faith attests not only to the human search for God, the human search for God, but principally to God's search for us, a point that Pope John Paul frequently made. And I should mention a parable of uh, this wonderful spiritual writer of uh, the Congregation of the Holy Cross, John Donne, you may have read, he's one of the most, was now deceased just a couple of weeks ago, in which, in his book, I don't remember which one, he speaks about a man who's searching for God and climbs up, uh, makes a very arduous trip up a mountain where he has been told God is to be found, only to discover that God has gone down the other side searching for him. Now, it's not the deepest uh, 
barrel in the world, but it does show something of the issue here. What God wants, and this is the critical question to ask, what does God want? What does God want? I, what, now I should put it that way, so, because we are already saying what we want. What does God want? All right? And what God wants is to share with us nothing less than a communion of life, a share or participation in the divine Trinitarian life. As a, a Lutheran theologian of my acquaintance says in a book on the Trinity, um, make, he, God wants to make room in the Trinitarian life for us. He, as Saint Irenaeus says, who has no need of anyone, shares, wants to share the communion of his life with us. This is the basic starting point for understanding the Christian faith, but also in particular for the unique role of Jesus Christ in the salvation of the human race. For the idea that God wants to share the communion of his life with persons who are not God cannot come from anyone but God himself. Now, here another, if you'll forgive me, trivial analogy. You've all had crushes in your life. Not some of you are young enough yet to have them still. But you know, what is the, the, the phenomenology of the crush? The other person doesn't care about your existence, right? So you can be very much in love with someone who never talks to you or looks at you or thinks about you, and you could even become a stalker. People <laughs> have done so. But this, you see, why is this the case? Because a relationship of any significance requires mutual communication. And in the part of God, we are not in the position of being stalkers. You see, God has taken the first, initi the, first uh, the initiative here. The initiative comes from God's side, both to reconcile us because of sin, we will talk about this a little bit later, and to make possible a kind of life that would not only be impossible for us, but unthinkable as well. Who would ever think of this? Salvation in this comprehensive sense, in this Christian sense, for salvation doesn't stand for one thing that all religions agree on. All you have to do is study a little of them on Wikipedia, and you could find that out without getting a doctorate in the subject. Salvation in this comprehensive self, in this Christian sense, is not something that can be arranged or organized by human beings. It cannot come from the created order, for the created order has neither the resources to achieve it, nor the imagination to conceive such a destiny for human persons. Arians, Neo-Aryans and their fellow travelers, of whom there are many walking and alive today, throughout history are willing to acknowledge that Jesus is a savior, a savior, but then it seems that, and this is a quote from uh, uh, Alan Torrance, an Anglican theologian, which I heard him say, it was, struck me deeply, then they say that salvation is nothing more than a minor adjustment internal to the contingent order. Great line. He's the nephew of Thomas Torrance. Salvation, to continue, is something that one creature performs in relation to others. That's really the key to Arianism. It's not simply the denial of the divinity of Christ, but the conviction that salvation doesn't need a divine savior. Very important insight. Given that salvation in the Christian sense of the term involves both reconciliation of sinners and the elevation of creaturely persons to a new kind of life, it cannot come from within this world. Saviors are a dime a dozen when one fails to grasp what is at stake. We need to be delivered not just from error, a significant problem, or suffering, a very significant problem, or desire, causes us a lot of problems, or injustice, 
or poverty. You see, all things that in fact do require, about which we do want to uh, be delivered. We, to understand what the Christian faith means by and promises by salvation, we must grasp the peril of the human condition, which is far deeper than any of those terms can describe, as well as the glory, more importantly, of the destiny to which we are being drawn. In God's plan, what God desires is nothing less than to share his life with us. If the salvation that the triune God wills for the entire human race entails communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then the creaturely and sinful obstacles to this communion must be overcome. Right? It has never been claimed of anyone but Jesus Christ, as St. Paul says, Jesus of Nazareth, delivered to you as Christ and Lord, never been claimed of anyone but he, that he could and did overcome these obstacles. This is an important, simple, factual claim about what re religious leaders have offered. And that he could and did make us sharers in the divine life. Through him we are both healed of sin and raised to an adoptive participation in the life of the Blessed Trinity and nothing less. Now the obstacles to this participation are either overcome or they are not overcome. If they are not overcome, then Christians have nothing for which to hope for for themselves, much less for others, you see. In that case, they will hawk an empty universal salvation on the highways of the world. If Christians abandon the, pro abandon the proclamation of Christ's unique meter mediatorship as the divine only begotten Son of the Father, they will have no other mediatorship with which to replace it. We need the Savior who is not just any Savior. Now, I grant you the question how persons who are not now explicit believers in Christ can actually come to share in the salvation that God desires for the human race and that God, Christ alone makes possible is a critically important question, but it is not my topic here. If Christians, the, 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 the point I want to make is that however we answer that question, If Christians, in the holy admirable desire to be respectful of non-believers, no longer confess Christ's unique mediatorship in making ultimate communion with the Blessed Trinity a real possibility for persons who are not God, then the problem of how non-Christians can share in it is not resolved, it simply evaporates. For Christians to have a truly universal hope and confidence in the salvation of persons who are not Christians, they have to affirm the unique role of Christ in bringing this salvation about, not just for Christians, but for others as well. Karl Barth, a theologian, a great theologian of the 20th century, a Protestant, reformed theologian, pointed out that the real peril is not for non-Christians, it's for us, thinking of that passage where our Lord speaks, but they know. You know we know what we should be seeking. Though they, those whom, who remain in ignorance of Christ or reject him do not know. So the, the big anxiety should be for ourselves, not for them. Okay, we'll come back to that, I assume, in the questions. Why we need Christ to become authentically human? It's connected, actually. This is the second challenge that I see. Here, the fundamental misunderstanding is shaped by what has been called the culture of authenticity. This is the idea that somehow being a Christian involves giving up or suppressing what is uniquely human or unique in each one of us and accepting an external criterion or measure which is alien to one's true self. 
Like the aforementioned culture of pluralism, the supporting matrix of ideas behind this sense that, to quote uh, Charles Taylor, who has written a book called The Ethics of Authenticity, it's a much smaller book than A Secular Age, and you might want to read it, but I think everything in it will be obvious to you once I've described it. He says, each of us has an original way of being human. It's an ingrained feature of modernity and penetrates popular culture at every level. Sometimes in philosophy, philosophers call it expressive individualism, and it resembles moral relativism, but actually it functions as a kind of moral ideal. This is terribly, terribly important to understand. For Taylor says, the soft relativism that seems to accompany the ethic of authenticity in fact asserts, let each person do their own thing. One shouldn't criticize the other's values because they have as much of a right to live their own life as you do. Not only, however, is it immoral to be intolerant of the values of others, it is immoral to allow some extrinsic measure to displace one's own pursuit of one's authentic self. This is very, very interesting. Fundamental to this moral ideal is the understanding, I'm quoting Taylor again, that each of us has his or her way of being human, of realizing our humanity, and that it is important to find and live out one's own. You see what I mean when I say that you've already heard this? You don't need Taylor's book. He describes it brilliantly, though. As against surrendering to conformity with a model imposed on us from outside by society, by the previous generation, your parents, for example, or religious and political authority. Close quote. That's Taylor. These ideas pose a considerable challenge to a true understanding of Christian discipleship, what it entails for every human being. In response, the first thing that we need to affirm follows directly from Christ's unique mediatorship. To become sharers in the communion of divine life, we must become like the Son so that the Father sees and loves in us what he sees and loves in Christ. We become conformed to Christ in order to be at home in the shared life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But conformation to Christ, that is the principle of our transformation, it's a conformation that is a transformation of us, is not a slavish conformity to a model that is external, but the realization of our distinctive and unique personal identity. This must be so, for otherwise the communion with the Blessed Trinity to which this transformation is ordered could not be achieved. All of us, again, without a degree in psychology, recognize unhealthy relationships, where the inequality in the relationship causes one person to continually diminish and the other one to flourish. We say unhealthy, right? Because in normal, I mean, in good, healthy human relationships, whether they be friendships or marriage or whatever, both should flourish together. I mean, I say, God knows, God knows this. See, God is not interested in the suppression or absorption of our, what we are, but for us to become fully what we are because an interpersonal relationship presupposed this mutual flourishing. Of course, God is not flourishing. God is, if I may put it, fully flourished. That's what being God is. But we are growing, you see. The image of God in us consists precisely of the spiritual capacities of knowing and loving. We are created in the image of God. God is a knower and a lover. So are we which is directed toward interpersonal communion, which is the very, you might say, essence of the divine life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in mutual interpersonal, to use our words, not entirely orthodox, but we'll be okay for the moment, 
possible. To claim, as does expressive individualism, that each person has an original way of being human is not to deny that each person shares a kind of nature which can be described and is characterized by particular natural capacities, especially knowing and loving. In the Christian understanding, authentic interpersonal communion presupposes the full relation, I mean the full realization, not the absorption or suppression of the individual persons who enter into it. In a sense, you could say we have no problem with the ethics of authenticity, understood in this sense. If Christ is to be the pattern for the transformation accomplished in us by the Holy Spirit, that can only mean that in being conformed to him, we each discover and realize our unique identities as persons. This is an outrage, almost outrageous claim. Listen to Matthew 16, 24 and following. If a man, our Lord says to his disciples, wants to be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life, whoever wants to be himself, you might say in my reading of it, whoever wants to fulfill himself or herself, whoever wants to do that, you might say, as, as their objective, will lose it. Whereas whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It sounds paradoxical and requires a lot of pondering. It's one of the most paradoxical statements, in a way, in the, in the, in the scriptures, because it seems counterintuitive. Who else is going to save your life if you don't, after you've gotten out from under your parents' wings, at any rate? In ordinary experience, here, excuse me, Christ asserts in effect that each person will find his true, his or her true self only by being conformed to him. Amazing. In ordinary experience, this would be, as I said, an outrageous thing to say. None of us, whether as teachers or parents or pastors, no matter how inflated our conceptions of ourselves or how confident our sense of our abilities, would ever dare to say, though we might think it, would ever dare to say to anyone in our charge that they will be, find their true selves only by imitating us. Yet this is precisely what Christ asserts. In effect, this means that an indefinite number of persons will realize their distinctive identities by being conformed to him, only the, son, only the Son of God could make such a claim on us. Only the perfect image of God, who is the person of the Son, could constitute the principle and pattern for the transformation and fulfillment of every human person who has ever lived in the name of heaven. Right? The more we are conformed to his image, the more authentically we become truly ourselves. This is very important in confronting the ethics of authenticity. Okay, why is the moral law also going to, these three themes are connected. And as I say, I think they're at the basis of many other issues, that challenges. The moral life, it is the idea that the moral law is more or less an arbitrary constraint in which certain things are permitted and certain things are forbidden, irrespective of their bearing on human goodness and flourishing. This idea has a very long history, too, by I will spare the details. It served to foster what came to be regarded and experienced as a culture of legalism in the church that was decisively rejected by the magisterium in the encyclical Veritatis Splendor, one of the most important encyclicals of one of the greatest teaching pontificates in history, John Paul II. A legalist perspective on the moral life creates a significant barrier to authentic Christian existence, as I will try to show briefly. It is of critical importance 
in addressing this challenge to insist on the priorities of good and evil for assessing rightness and wrongness. Now you would say, hello, that's obvious. Bear with me. Whereas legalistic moral systems insist, or at least imply, that actions are good and thus right because permitted, and bad and thus wrong because forbidden, authentic Catholic moral teaching maintains that a certain course of action is forbidden and wrong because it is bad for the agent, the person, the acting person, to use uh, John Paul's expression, while another course of action is permitted and encouraged and right because it is good for the agent. The commandments do not simply lay down requirements that are indifferent vis-a-vis -vis their impact on human goodness and happiness. A homey example. You're cooking dinner. It's about five o'clock. One of your kids comes in eating a handful of Oreos. You have them here, don't you? And you say, stop eating those cookies. And they say, why, Mom? Now, this is not a lesson in child rearing, but a lesson in moral theology. So bear with the limitations of the following remarks. You have many courses of action. I'm going to suggest two that illumine the issue. You could say, in this house, we do not eat cookies before dinner. If you want to eat cookies before dinner, or biscuits, excuse me, go next door. They don't have this rule. <laughs> okay? Now, you see here, you are appealing to your authority as the lawgiver in this, for, in, within these four walls. Now, you could also say to the, your child, don't eat those cookie biscuits because you will, they will make you ill, or you won't want to eat this thing that I'm cooking, which is slaving over, which is your favorite dinner, or something of that, you see. Here, you are not appealing to your authority, although you have it, but to their good. You see the difference? Let me tell you, it's a big difference. Now, it is true, and we should note this, that there are times when your children, and all of us have experienced this, do not understand why it's good for them or bad for them. And so you have to use your authority as the lawgiver, and thank God our parents did, and my novice master and many other superiors. You, know, you sometimes have to say to people, just don't do it, and only later do they discover why it was. You see? And sometimes they admit it. To themselves. But you see the difference. Okay? All right, let's keep that in mind. In legalistic moral doctrine, the principal virtue is simply obedience. You obey. You see? Because the law is this, and you obey it. One obeys the commandments, whatever the content. There were some moral theologians, I won't go into who, who, who said that? Whatever you could, that some of them said, said that God could command you to hate him and you would have to obey. You see the model. Because they're enjoined by God. But in classic Catholic moral theology, the observance of the commandments is meant to foster a whole range of virtues, chastity, justice, prudence, courage, and so on. See? They're not all obedience, and they cannot all be reduced to obedience. The only virtue to which all of the rest can be reduced, if you will, is charity, as St. Paul taught us. And therefore, these virtues cover the whole range of the good of the human person. In other words, the commandments of the moral law treat prim primarily of good and evil, rather than of the permitted and the forbidden. They thus express an order established by divine wisdom, as St. Aquinas insisted, St. Thomas Aquinas insisted, in which the moral law accords with the divinely created finalities of human nature and is given to human beings to make them good and virtuous. 
To use an analogy, I think, which will be illuminating to you, and one which, of which St. Paul might approve, the commandments are more like an athlete's daily exercise and diet regime than they are like traffic laws. Traffic regulations require that we stop on red and go on green, and in Rome, faster on yellow. <laughs> Not only in Rome, I did it in New York as well. But it could just as well have been the other way around. See, there's nothing intrinsic to those colors. It's a convention. We've agreed that these will be the way we organize traffic. But the athlete follows the daily regimen enjoined by his or her coach. Suppose you decide you want to run the London Marathon the next time, and you have never run around the block. Well, you've got some work to do, and you may find a, a, a coach, and maybe even pay them, as many Olympic uh, athletes do, to help you to do that. See? in order to achieve and maintain a certain level of performance, otherwise unattainable. There is a fit between the regimen and the results, more or less, you know, if you don't fall down and break a leg or something. The moral law is like that. It contains non-arbitrary injunctions. God didn't sit down and say, I need ten commandments. What will they be? One, two, three, four, five give them to Moses, Moses takes them down the mountain. Now, these, the commandments are like a regimen that you would give to an athlete, not like traffic laws. In fact, they're utterly unlike traffic laws. The analogy of traffic laws is irrelevant to the moral law. At this point, we might turn to St. Augustine, and particularly to his confessions to understand what is involved in this authentically Catholic understanding of the moral law. I should say how much harm had been done by this other conception that I am criticizing. Not only do people, some people lose their faith because of that, but also they think crazy things like, well, the Pope could change these things. See, as if the Pope weren't more bound in his role as teacher of the faith than the rest of us. Anyway, St. Augustine. He frequently invites his readers to consider the things that they have desired and the things that they desire now, me and you, to consider, in effect, the experience of desire. When we have thought about these things, that we have desired and sought, St. Augustine asks us to acknowledge that in the end, we have often lost interest and become bored with these very things, look in your closets, drawers, and garages. Okay? And then we move on to seeking other things. Now, some people interpret this as a lament, but St. Augustine, in my view, is not lamenting this, but offering it as a thing to ponder about ourselves. And what we learn is that no good thing that we have wanted and even possessed can finally quench desire itself. Because we are made for the uncreated good, capital G, appropriately, which is God himself, in whom our desire finally rests. I mean, if St. Augustine had made no more of a contribution to the history of Christian thought, this alone would um, merit his great role, place. This means, of course, that the good things of this world, and all the more so the good of other persons, far from being obstacles, as some Christians have believed and taught, unfortunately, obstacles in our quest for ultimate happiness point us to the good itself, which is their source and in which they share. Chocolate, good wine, a well-made stake, and so on. These are not obstacles to God. When we understand that they are good, we have some sense of what it means to be good, and therefore what God is. I should say that the denial of going into the desert or into a monastery of these authentic goods for the sake 
of a more focused concentration on God is not what I mean by mistakes made by Christians. That is an, a thing, an imitation of Christ which is appropriate. No, I'm talking about the forbidding of the enjoyment of good things by some Christian communities, especially after the Reformation. I shall not mention any names. If we do not love the good things of this world, my brothers and sisters in Christ, how shall we be able to love their maker? I think St. Thomas would say that, although he didn't quite. The triune God who made us for himself and who wants to share the communion of Trinitarian love with us uses the good things of this world to lead us to him. Who is, I could say, we could say, do say, goodness itself. The danger and sometimes the tragedy of human existence is desire to desire and love the created good as if it were divine. To invest an absolute value in what cannot finally satisfy the human heart. There's always this possibility. We have all done it and will do it again. That we hang our hearts on things that cannot bear the weight. That's what sin is. But through the guidance of the moral law and the assistance of divine grace and the sacraments, rightly ordered desire and love of the good things of this world and the good things of other per the good of other persons is already a participation in the good which is God himself. Eros, as Pope Benedict pointed out in his encyclical on love, is meant to let us, lead us to agape, to the love of God and the love of one another in God. We must resist absolutely the misreading, sometimes perverse, that claims to see in Christian faith the suppression of the ordinary fulfillments of human earthly life. It is not what God intended particularly human intimacy and love, even when a little disordered, in favor of a good beyond life. One leads to the other. The Christian faith, for Christian faith, the whole range of human desire, or to use the technical language of Aquinas, the inclination to the good embedded in the very structure of human existence, finds its complete fulfillment in the love of the triune God and nothing less that doesn't exclude a lot of other goods along the road. We might call the unity of and continue, continuity between Eros and Agape the sanctification of desire. That's what we say about desire, that it needs to be sanctified, not suppressed. It's not an evil. It is to this end that the moral law directs us. In conclusion, I want to address the question why it's important to think about these challenges. Why, in other words, Christianity makes more than an emo emotional sense. Why we need the Savior who is not just any Savior. Why we need Christ to become authentically human. Why the moral law is good for us. These are only some, though in many ways to me the most critical, of the challenges we face in a culture that is, to put it mildly, as Archbishop did, particularly supportive of the Christian faith. In order to confront these challenges, we need a confident evangelizing spirit and a robust, though not overbearing, apologetics. One of the books in the bibliography says, how to defend the faith without raising your voice. In such circumstances, not unlike those faced by the apostles and the early Christian communities of the ancient world, very similar to our own. The apostles did not meet welcoming uh, communities, either among the Jews to which they first went, or among pagans, Greek, uh, Hellenistic pagans, Roman and Greek, and God knows what else. They were all martyred to a man except St. John, remember. So the message was not very welcome all the time. And we are in a similar situation. Whether we'll be martyred, I doubt. John Allen, one book I just bought today and read about 50 pages of, 
by John Allen is I just saw it in CTS or Paul, uh, Pauline sisters. It's called the war, um, the global war against Christians. It's the best. There have been a few books like this. Rupert Shorts, which I mentioned in the bibliography, he's the religion editor of TLS. It's a good one and Philip Jenkins, but this one I think is, the, so far, is the best of the, of the three, if you're interested. It's a harrowing story, actually, or many, many harrowing stories. In these circumstances, retrenchment, my friends in Christ, is not an option for us. Neither can we take refuge in the powerful emotional comforts of the Christian faith. This enticing path is traced quite brilliantly, actually, I think, by the British author Francis Spufford, who's actually not a philosopher or theologian, but I think a critic. I'm not absolutely sure. It's the only book I ever read of his, but in an otherwise engaging recent book entitled, very interesting, Unapologetic, colon, why, despite everything, Christianity can still make surprising emotional sense. His argument, in a nutshell, is that what makes Christianity work for most of us is not so much its doctrinal as its emotional truths. The way, in short, and this is not a soft book, by the way. He's not talking about the cuddly feeling you feel when you smell incense. He's talking about how it helps us to get through the terrible muddles of life, failure that we cause, we might say sin, especially the ones, as I say, we create ourselves. This emotional sense is not something that one can be reasoned into, but something that one can only grasp through experience Father Stephen, who's sitting here from the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, and I went to see Much Ado About Nothing last night. It's quite marvelous, even though Vanessa Redgrave was indisposed. And in the program, there was a picture of Alec Guinness, someone who played Hamlet, I think, or done a long time ago, and whom, as Stephen told me, um, uh, was affected greatly and converted to the Catholic faith by an incident that occurred when he was filming in Hungary the movie The Prisoner. And he was walking back to his hotel dressed in a cassock, which was his costume in the film. He was Cardinal Vincenti, was it? And a boy from across the street crossed over and took his hand and walked along with him to the hotel, thinking, of course, that he was a priest. And then said, well, I have to then, at the hotel, left him and said, I have to go now. Goodbye. And Guinness says, I, this is in his biography, autobiography, I suppose. Guinness says that it was this experience that caused him to be converted. Of course, it was an act of grace. Many, many more things were involved. But in his account of it, he said, a, a, a faith that could uh, sustain such trust he said, would, was one that he could believe in, or something like that. I don't have the exact words, but you get the point. That's an experience, you see. So Spufford is surely on to something here. But I think that most of us would say it's not enough. I think the first letter of Peter says that. <laughs> Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Peter 3, 1 Peter 3.15, famous line. Behind the emotional truth of the Christian faith, there needs to be something, I would say, solid. It is, if it is to be anything more than a comforting illusion. You see, there's this great danger, like a tale we tell to children who are afraid of the dark. Strong people don't need those tales, the implication is, right? The emotional sense that the Christian faith makes is rooted in convictions, principally that God wants to make a place for us in the life of the Blessed Trinity, that Jesus Christ opens the way to this communion and that our transformation in his image not only gets us through the muddle of sin, but also launches us upon the life of glory. By the way, we mustn't think of this communion as something in the future. There's consummation is in the future. 
but it began in baptism. Our Lord, the Holy Spirit, we, St. Paul speaks of us, our bodies as being the temples of the Holy Spirit, and therefore for, uh, he gives us an argument for being chaste. Incredibly powerful passage. Scary for most of us. But it's something that's already going on in our hearts and will be, as I say, consummated in the end. This is the Gospel of John is full of this, especially the discourse at the end of our Lord to his disciples. There is certainly will be occasions when it would be important and necessary for us to explain how all this can be not only emotionally comforting, but really true. I want to end with something that was in today's Daily, Daily Telegraph. It was a report on some things that Archbishop Carey uh, said in a paper to the bishops. I only will quote a few. This first sentence may be a bit of an exaggeration, but perhaps not such. He says, Christianity is a, in, is a generation away from extinction in Britain. And he said, it must adopt a new missionary stance. He uses the word re-evangelization. The re-evangelization of England is required, especially for the young. And he mentions, I'm very happy to say, that we must imitate the Anglo-Saxon saints like Cuthbert, Hilda, and Aden. And here's his last, and this is my last line for you, because it summarizes what I've said. He says, we have to give cogent reasons to young people why the Christian faith is relevant to them. I'd say probably true, but... Well, I don't do it for the moment. Thank you very much. <laughs>